Eastern, and we talk about guns for an hour, uh, normally, and uh, it's episode 863, so we've been doing the show for a while, and uh, each day of the week we have a different theme, and on Mondays uh, we talk about behind the scenes, things like that, um, on Tuesdays it's Second Amendment, on Wednesdays Entertainment, and on Thursdays Tech and Industry, on Fridays we look back at the week. Um, we do this as an interactive effort. Nothing we do online it is designed to uh, spout off our positions on stuff, but instead to have uh, to inspire and uh, create online conversations. So we're watching the comments from gunchannels.com community. It's going on six years old, a place for conversations like this. Anybody that's interested in jumping in, uh, feel free to grab a link over there. And then, of course, we're using YouTube as a tool to. Uh, with this uh, till the end of the month when they change things up again. It's been a six year ride on YouTube using their tech and uh, we'll continue to evolve and adapt to whatever tech comes next. I see uh, DTP out there and Armithia. Thanks for jumping in. I don't see, for whatever reason, I'm seeing little squares instead of uh, cartoons anymore. But Armithia is, you're welcome to jump in if you want to jump over to Gun Channels and throw you a link. Otherwise, thanks for, for joining. It'll be a short show. I'm not Yankee. I'm not Matt. I'm not one of these people that likes to just get online and chat. So, I may talk to you. It'll go quick. Um, I am attempting to uh, work on 2A history. Right. So we got the uh, gun rights policy conference coming up in September. That conference is I think the 34th or 35th year that uh, Alan Gottlieb has been putting that on. Each of the gun owners' rights groups get together each year, once a year. And they uh, get together and they take each one takes the stage. It's a conference, so they'll talk about what they've been doing, what they need, and what they see is you know, whatever they want to talk about. And uh, the end result is uh, you get a lot of uh, information. You're in a room with a lot of uh, motivated people that either created or founded or run these organizations. Uh, the people that fund these organizations are there. That's pretty inspiring, too, watching what would that be a five digit or a five. What do they call that um, you know, a check with five placeholders in it, you know, changing hands to, to see organizations succeed. It's neat to be in a room like that. And uh, I started going to the show many years ago when it was showed up in Phoenix here. And uh, then that I got hooked. It was interesting. I knew that uh, Second Amendment was more important and at risk than uh, just a concept. It's uh, not something that's for granted. That we can take for granted. It's something that needs to be defended. And uh, the Gun Rights Policy Conference is coming up again in Phoenix, so I'm going to be able to attend it. I could literally walk there if I had to. So it's not going to be a financial burden to attend. Uh, this year will be the third year in a row that I've attended both the Gun Rights Policy Conference and if I get invited again to AMCON. And the uh, only frustration I have with either of the two events is that they only happen once a year. And in 2019, I don't think that's... I think that's more than an oversight. I think that's that's handicapping our our side. I think that we have the ability to uh, use tools like this one that we had available to us for the last six years. I've been part of the expansion of the conversation and the inclusion of more and more entities, more and more people coming on board to create content, more and more capable entities being part of the, the community. And it's uh, not just ignor ignoring these people. It's not inviting these people in to be part of it. There's no need for everyone to attend the Gun Rights Policy Conference in person when it, they have the ability to stream interactively. And uh, there's certainly no reason for the people who attend to only meet once a year. So I've voiced that frustration for the last couple of years and this last year quite a bit to the point where I'm a dick and I'm not well received anymore because of my frustration. I uh, saw that it was getting imminent and now we're two months away and as far as i know no one has gotten together who's part of amcon or the gun rights policy conference on any kind of a regular basis and it's frustrating so uh 
anyway, that's where we're at with 2019 going into the Gun Rights Policy Conference since end of September. Then we'll have October, November, or cover September, November. Then we'll have December and January, and then we'll be well into the election cycle. So luckily, right at the beginning of that all, we have a uh, SHOT Show, a potential for the entire industry to get together. Certainly the Second Amendment media has another opportunity to get together after gun rights policy if they don't get together at one of the other events that brings the industry together uh, between now and then. NRA carry guard, um, a couple other things that are smaller, uh, but certainly we have opportunities to get together as a 2A media. And instead of uh, taking yet another opportunity to observe what's going on out there, I'd like to think we could take the opportunity to figure out ways to work together to pull the rope in the same direction so that we can not just motivate and uh, inspire, but also affect or maybe influence um, you know, what's out there. Uh, think about the Second Amendment media. If we were to all gather our resources and individually or together uh, bring the gun owners rights groups, an inventory, an arsenal, so to speak, pun intended, of what we have available, the reach and the, the numbers that we have to, to work with and let them use strategy instead of just wishing and hoping and whatnot. So uh, to that end, I've got this 2A history project going. Uh, you can buy cards, but I should have not even put those in there really. I really want this to be a $2 effort, $2 for 2A, to help show uh, the power of $2. Um, 1,000 people throw $2 at me. I'm almost good to go all the way to September. If 2,000 people threw $2 at me, I am definitely good to go. I don't have that many bills, just mainly paying off servers and making, you know, keeping some water in the cup or whatever. I'm not looking for a lot, uh, but if, uh, you know, I could spend the time that I normally spend uh, making sure that there's money in the bank and, um, you know, income coming in by either creating stuff on the store or uh, going out and doing little tasks here and there. And, you know, it's not only the nine to five, so it's going out and doing little tasks here and there. If I could uh, alleviate some of that stress and pressure financially with a fundraising project. I figured I'd throw it out there. So far, it's enough to pay for about the cell phone bill. So I appreciate that. Thank you. That's eight people paid for the cell phone bill. I'm going to throw it out there and I'm going to uh, encourage people to participate and share. Uh, I don't expect the whoever four people, pretty much uh, DTP and uh, Armentia are watching tonight. So um, I don't expect them to uh, to foot the bill or anything, but it would be nice to see a bunch of people share this, right, as an exercise in uh, crowdfunding, get more people on board. I'm hoping to uh, get to some of the people that are um, publishers and radio people uh, who have different reach and to bring their audiences who might not be motivated or not have a call to action very often to go online uh, to start realizing the tools that we have online. But either way, uh, I'll be working on what I can to get people together for the Gun Rights Policy Conference. And part of that is doing some uh, cartooning. So in the daytimes when I can, I pull a couple hours away. I usually jump into Dead Horses lobby chat or just start up a quick chat and uh, get to work on some of the cartoons. My goal is to uh, create some cartoons so that there's some consistency on the imagery, uh, but basically uh, create a deck of cards that have... Um, sort of like flashcards. They're not going to have pips like a playing cards, but they're going to be the form factor of a deck of cards. Um, and then they'll be like flashcards just to help put the number of people who are involved and where they fall on a timeline of 2A history, uh, just to have that organized in a different way for no reason. It doesn't need to exist. It's not going to solve anything. It's just simply an exercise to uh, allow people to participate in this project, to create something that might make what some of us, I think I learn a little bit easier when I'm holding cards in my hand versus coming through a book, but it doesn't matter because there's no book. Um, but basically to gather uh, data so that eventually I'll be able to do something with all this data. But I wish I had, you know, the ability to, uh, to just spend time on this thing. I don't, but um, I put the project up to give myself some time, right, to allow, allow people to offer time and then... Uh, what I can do is get some of these interviews in, or excuse me, the cartoons are the results of the interview. So I would be getting some more of these interviews in, hopefully with people that are going to be attending AMCON, which would give me the excuse to get online with them and show them what a hangout's all about. Uh, in a few weeks here, we'll have whatever the next iteration of hangouts is going to be and show them that so that, again, there's at least a chance that some of them can get together before AMCON, before gun rights policy and, uh, utilize that time as efficiently, as effectively as possible. Uh, there's some massive reach. There's been some massive projects out there recently. 
anybody who tells you that 2A doesn't have um, reach and doesn't have interest right now is not paying attention. There is probably more interest in 2A now than I've ever seen, both in eyeballs and in money. So, yeah, there might not be um, frenzy. There might not be scarcity. And there might not be bloat or whatever it's called when there's just like an excess of AR-15s laying around and everybody's moaning and complaining because they're either starving or they're overfed. But uh, we're certainly in a time of plenty when it comes to awareness and and uh, follow through on calls to action. There's been some tremendous projects happening recently that are firearms related. And uh, you know, think of the uh, 1639, a massive project, $100,000 plus. Uh, not everyone's, no, I don't think anybody's going to suggest that the way that was raised was ideal. It's not something that we can use or should use or would use on a, as a strategy for any further uh, issues, but it was certainly a way to raise awareness that uh, however many people participated could raise $100,000 in such a short amount of time to battle the unlimited pockets of Bloomberg. But not everything is Bloomberg, and uh, not everything is that consequential. Something like Tony Simon. Um, of the people I've met in the last year or so, I can't imagine somebody who's worth, who who's, has more value to the Second Amendment. And where he is and what he's doing and to whom he's doing that with and for is, is all to be commended. And it's ultimately frustrating for me, somebody who's sitting in Tucson has been doing fucking internet for this long, to think about Tony over there dividing his time between work and that drive that he's got, that passion and that commitment and that... Uh, you know, he's already he's already proved that he's willing to do this over the last five years. So uh, the fact that um, you know the attention is there to be um, diverted or you know, opened up, open their eyes to his project is certainly uh, frustrating, but it's also a challenge. And like, would be fucking boring if we didn't have challenges. So I'll shut up. Thanks for joining us. Dead horse jumped in. I don't know if I mentioned that he's jumping in from Utah. Armithia jumping in from Texas. Please give me your email and the side thing. I don't know what's going on, but every time I try to type in Armithia, it doesn't show up anything on my Gmail, so I don't know what's going on with what I have for email. Anyway, thanks for jumping in. No, they won't chat. Talk. They're all muted and they won't talk. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, and uh, thanks, Rob. Did everybody miss the live gun giveaways? We have, like, six gun giveaways. What's going on Anyway, we had like six gun giveaways. Yeah, you're getting a weird like horse trot echo. You have the weird whoop clop echo. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was weird. It was sounded like horses, like whoop clop, whoop clop, whoop clop. But anyway, Armenthia, if you would drop me your email in the side chat just so I can send you a test email. Um I will. I've Got to get on. I was doing gun channels on my phone. I'm going to do it on the. Computer. Oh, no, that's fine then. If you would, I know we've emailed. Just bounce an email back to me because is it that guy's wife? Something? It Where's is. That? Okay. But I'll, I'll, I'll reset I need it. To, no problem. I need to go through and I think it must be. I use Google Gmail or whatever too much, but I think in there there's a way to go through the contacts and screw with them because I get. A bunch of people who I haven't emailed in forever. Like I'll type in a letter and mm -hmm. seven year old email addresses will pop up that I just have never used. So I need to go in there and tell, try to figure out. I'm sure you can tell it to quit giving me all these other T's then. Because half the time, what I'll do is I'll just type a letter on the keyboard and see what it shows me and be like, oh, yeah, I should send it to that person. Oh, yeah, that person. You realize, though, that if you're not spelling Armenthia right, that it won't come up anyway, right? Oh, I don't spell nothing. I let I I put in like R and then it you know or A and then it tells me all the auto completes for A. You know, like gotcha. I, I I yeah, I don't try. I have the worst speller, so I definitely have to copy and paste email, phone numbers, anything important. I just copy and paste. Um, let's see, seahorses underwater. I don't know what that is. I don't know why, but here, look, everybody can look at my screen and see what I'm saying. Something glitched on my YouTube or something. See, I don't see nothing anymore. Like the little cartoons, even if I try to put one out, it won't show up as like a real cartoon, whatever these things are called. I'll go down here and pick one that isn't stupid. You're like this telescope, look, and it just looks like a square for me. So I don't know if my 
computer's broke or internet's broke or but I can't see nothing when you guys type these things anymore. Is they working for everybody else? Like everybody else sees a little telescope picture? Yeah, mine's working, but I'm on Windows 10 and I update every time an update comes up. Oh, you think that's a Windows thing? I don't know if I update. I think I, I think you have to update Windows 10 every once in a while. Is it just on Google? That this happening? I have to pay attention. I don't really. I just noticed it the last couple of, since I haven't been able to put pancake parts in there for a while. Anyway, so I was chatting there about the 2A History Project, but today's topic is how fun, how is 2A fun? So um, if anybody wants to, okay, thank you. If anybody wants to. Uh, um, uh, oh, and it, just so you that. know, you did just put some little icon up there. I don't know if it's a microphone or a telescope, but it's oh, no, yeah. with three legs. I tried to uh, screen share it. They probably didn't see it on the phone, but I was screen sharing. Whenever I did the little telescope thing out of the list, it just shows up on my screen as a little square. It's a telescope down below when I click it, but when uh -huh. it shows up in my thing, it's a little square. Uh -huh. I get little happy faces that are black and white, and then everything else is just a little square. So uh -huh. something glitched. I think it's on my browser. Maybe that. Yeah, I would think it would come up under A, so I need to just clear out all my other A stuff. Oh, did, did you get it? Yeah. Okay. I just sent you one just to, so that but you don't have to reply. Just, or if you want to make sure it gets there or whatever, but just that one bounce back and forth. Okay. I can say, I don't know why it doesn't. I'll put in like some other people's too that have been, I was trying to think like Mike or something. Like his is M W. So mm -hmm. for whatever reason, when I type in M, like I can type in W and Mike shows up. So I got to go in there and clean up Mike. I think I'm just used to texting you. And I'm really bad about that. But since. Uh... Well, see, that's the thing. I, my phone isn't even near me half the time. when Because I, I just leave my phone wherever it's plugged in to charge. Because I don't use my phone. I use my phone to Instagram. But I use my computers for internet. Uh -huh. So uh, zapping me links and stuff to the phone. Unless I'm on the car. If I'm driving, I guess. It's different, but normally if I'm around computers, I just don't. Know. So email is better for you. Uh, for like a show or something, yeah. Because I, I mean, I check email enough that usually you know every couple of hours. So if there's a show or something on the winter, but not, uh, I'm not going to say I check email every hour. Or anything like that. Right. Uh, all right. So we were talking about how is two A fun? So. The people you meet. Uh, to me, that would probably be the funnest part. Like new people, you know, learn new new stuff. I like learning. I think learning's fun. You know, like learning new things and that you didn't know before. And yeah, to me, that's probably like the probably the funnest part about it is like the new people you meet and stories and especially from the old timers and stuff. Like man, you know, and that's just by like talk, you know, starting a conversation. Whether it's at the gun store, or the supermarket, or the swap meet, or whatever you're, wherever you're at, you know, and like, oh, that's a, you know, Smith and Wesson shirt, da da da. And, you know, it doesn't take much to start a conversation. Yeah, and being a persecuted segment of the population, we got camaraderie there or whatever, joint persecution. Yeah, you're like instantly almost best friends. Like, oh, you like guns? Yeah, I like guns too. Like, you know, we're best friends. Like, you know. <laughs> Patriot jumped in. So, like I say, this is all interactive. Anybody out there watching on the uh, chats wants to uh, throw in there too. What makes two eight fun? Well, thanks for the invite. What was it? What was the question? Uh, we got in. What makes two a fun? Oh man, uh, burning through a whole stack of ammo. I like that. And talking to the old timers, is, it's always cool to find out uh, their old tricks and tips, you know, because there's some old guy will say, oh, you don't do it like that. And if you, you know, sight in this way or something, it's always fun to kind of, you know, the regional stuff is pretty cool too, because there's a lot of different places that, that go about things a little different. That's kind of fun. 
traveling. And it's always fun to go to the gun shop, wherever you're at. I know, for me, learning. Uh, learning and then getting to share it and then somebody responding, being like, oh my gosh, I just saw your video and I'm going to share it with my wife and hopefully she'll want to go do this. And just little things like that that keep me excited about what I'm doing and I want to do more and, and it just keeps me wanting to go more and more. So, of course, opening a new firearm or getting, you know, at the gun shop, it's like, oh, this is so cool. And of course, like I said, getting to share it with everybody. So, and of course, traveling. I mean, we've gone places in the past year, year and a half that we've never been and met people that are our family now. Um, I mean, it's been an amazing journey. All right, so we got a bit of a uh, variety there, but I think a bunch of it went to people in different angles. And then the learning part, again, from different angles, but the learning is part of it, I think. Now, when you brought up the new guns part, let's start there, because guns are part of it, right? Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything, I mean, I, I'm i trying to think, like maybe instruments, musical instruments are about as interesting. I mean, computers are interesting in a different way, but is there, I don't, I can't think of any other thing that is like um, as much bang for the buck as a gun as far as a machine. It's just being an interesting thing. I mean, they're just it's you know they're all doing the same thing basically they're throwing a projectile in a direction right and the ways that they accomplish that is just crazy you know just the the, the the ways that they figure out how to accomplish that is crazy and they're they're you know price rank wise they're a, a you know again i can't think of anything that's more bang for the buck and i'm using a pun but that is you know, pun intended i guess but uh you know, like, I can't think of anything else, like model trains or anything, like everything, it takes up more room or it takes up your whole life or it's like, you know, where guns can do all that, I guess, but you can also enjoy them with just a gun or two and still understand, like having a 1911 done, like you can understand what it is to be a gun, per front, a gun person, a gun nut. The first time you can actually, without all the political issues, just take apart a 1911 and put it back together, like a car, you can't do that, you have to fix whole garage and tools and stuff. I'm trying to think, of, is there anything else? It's like a gun where it's purely mechanical and is intricate and involved and then so for so much variety. Not that we currently use nowadays. Like maybe I was going to say like back in the day, I'm sure there was all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, watches, maybe watches. Radios. But right, I mean, yeah, maybe in like the tube radios where you like would put one together and are like appreciate an old one that you keep going. Yeah, I guess radios is similar. Or even like radios, the ham like, radios. Well, that's that all for the amendment, so that's got some of the, like, core value to it. So I could definitely see radios being maybe, like, typewriters, you know, because of the, the whole history of them and what they meant to everything, free press and all that. But I just don't know that many typewriter people. Like, there's no yeah. group of typewriter people that are held together by the First Amendment, and people are like, you should know typewriters. You know, it's like that part of it guns have that's unique also. Like we're again because we appreciate them, we understand them. We're united. Like we are us against them. We don't appreciate them. We think that they can be turned on and off like a light switch. I guess fishing rods. I guess that's a good one, really, because that's completely mechanical. Oh yeah, yeah. Hardly tech, and they're totally useful. Yeah, I think fishing rods, knives. I guess even though there's no parts to them, really. But yeah, I think fishing rods is a, one of the best, best examples, right? Of something similar you could have a whole bunch of fishing rods really and still barely take up a shelf on your office or something. well i think technology has made us comfortable we have all these comforts of the day i imagine like back in the day everyone knew how to sew their own clothes and everyone knew how to you know shoe a horse and just like all sorts of stuff right but because of technology and comforts like you know we haven't had to deal with a lot of that stuff like you know maybe we don't have to worry about making our own blankets or clothes or well, that's a good point. When a blanket was a something. I mean, when you look at like the wagon trains, right? When they'd have to bail everything and just take what was important. Did they ever leave a blanket or stuff? Like, no, that stuff took forever to get, source, and make. It was appreciated, right? Like, 
that was necessary. Now you just get go to the Walmart and buy 700 blankets if you want. Who cares about a blanket anymore? So yeah, our priorities have changed a lot from like what's what's value and what's necess necessity, right? Do, do you think that it has a part of the other side not like, uh, understanding firearms as far as not having something like that that's so you know so available to them you know they don't have a firearm to take apart or to kind of focus their their thing on wait so who is that kind of who is they the the people that don't like guns anti-gunners or you know on the other side that say well why would you like that why you know you you shouldn't have those is it because they don't have something themselves that they can you know relate to I mean, well, they like, you know, podcasts and stuff like that. I mean, you can't. Really... I think, I mean, it's like a motorcycle, right? Like, I think yeah. it's really easy to dismiss motorcycles as dangerous, reckless, dangerous, horrible things, unless you understand them or appreciate them, or else you can deal with the fact that somebody likes something you don't like. But yeah, I think, yeah, people have never touched them, have no interest, do go out of their way to be scared of them to where they won't go near them or touch them or listen to anything. They, you know, they make themselves unaware hmm. gotta be it's gotta be a, a aspect of it right and just where they can't they can't understand why anybody would want something like that because it's just nothing they don't have anything in their life that actually you know could take that spot maybe i don't know if anyone has to throw in there's no real structure here but um then i mean you guys went to we started a new gun, so then, and then our MNPS said the thing about sharing. They meant like sharing when you get a new gun, like talking about it or whatever. But before the internet, we would go to the gun shop and we'd buy a new gun and then hang out at the gun shop for a while so that as other people came in, we could show off our new gun to them. <laughs> or we would run to the range and show off our new gun. So, yeah, that element of it, I can't imagine anyone has ever bought a new gun and didn't go show their friend. At some, I mean, except for maybe like mountain men, and then they would get together at rendezvous and show off their guns to each other. So, I'm almost positive the first gun got built by Browning or however, and then he showed it to somebody. Him. Yeah, he like showed it to the other guy in the building. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, even getting a new gun and stuff and, and getting to show it off and then taking a different spin on that, uh, I get to do I get to do DIY stuff that's totally gun related or totally channel related. And so I get to bring all my girly stuff into it. And it's not necessarily girly because I know you so and I don't mean it that way, but but I get to be me. I get to I get to do everything that I wanna do. And like your uh, AR pistol caddy. Yes. Is it not cool? I think I it's cool. Know. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing where if somebody let's say somebody did bust in there and they were looking around and they'd see that thing, they're gonna go, Okay, and they're gonna keep going because they're gonna figure you got like a book in there like some kind of lotion or whatever that ladies and have on site but like that's just they're just going to totally blow past that mm -hmm. so yeah i mean there's there's so many avenues with it um all the different targets you know it's not just go out and shoot it's the variety of targets you can shoot at i mean there's just you know some people like paper some like steel some like uh, objects, cans, whatever. I mean, it's just. That's a good one. And now, and that's something again, where, I mean, it, not just like the, somebody who's anti or against or indifferent to the point where they just don't care. And they have no interest in ever walking into a shop or experiencing anything, you know, they have no interest in seeing the other side, the other point of view. Um, then yeah, you only think that they're, I don't know, like they think that we worship violence or something or that we, we hold some sort of value to violence or to hate or something. And these are symbols of it when it's like having golf clubs or like a baseball bat and understanding that some bad people have done mean things with baseball bats, but understanding that you're playing baseball, you know, and you're talking, like you say, you're, you're the fun you can have and the, um, skill i guess that you can do and i guess i'm jumping in another one but the, i think the targets are um certainly 
like when you actually do something with your gun again people that think like the all we do is go to some range and shoot at paper or maybe like paper that has pictures of people on it like that's what they seriously think and they can't even understand how fun it could be to go to a range and shoot one of those like tic-tac-toe things or battleship or one of those like games yeah. that they put on the piece of paper Have you guys uh, over at your place, uh, Armenthi, have you ever shot like a toilet or uh, floor tiles or ceramic tiles of any kind? Uh, nothing like that that I'm aware of. I know that Clover has uh, shot at bowling pins. Bowling pins are no fun. They're like, they're designed to take abuse, right? They get smashed by a big bowling ball all the time and knocked around in the machines and all that. So they're like a piece of really big piece of plywood with a center that's like designed to take absorb shot. And then they got like a big plastic coat. You've seen them if you've seen them. So they'll sometimes get shot like for months before they even like fall apart. And then even then I've seen them where the like insides are just splinters and they fall out the shell and you can still shoot at the bowling pin looking thing for a while. But um, that's a little different because it knocks over. It's reactive, I guess. But uh, what I like about toilets, back in the day, we would take toilets out to like the quarry where they were just you know, scooping up gravel for whatever, and nobody cared. We would take a toilet, which was my fun. I, I thought it was the funnest just because of what it is and it falls apart. Uh, but ceiling tiles, or not ceiling tiles, but roof tiles, floor tiles are the same. Whenever you shoot something ceramic, of course, the first shot breaks it, shatters it. With a toilet, you can usually get three or four shots before it crumbles. But then you're just left with smaller and smaller targets. So we would shoot the toilets with like a rifle or something from far away. And it's just kind of neat to see a toilet break apart. You know, it's, it's a stupid toilet. Usually we're pissed because we had to take it out from plumbing or, you know, some problem with it or something. Anyway, so you're getting some aggression out. Anyway, it falls apart. And then you just get down to 22s and you're just shooting little quarter size pieces of ceramic at some point. And uh, out there, we would just wail on it until it was powder. So we didn't have to bring nothing back. But uh, I always thought. Uh, like that, like a big, sometimes you can find like a thing, a ceramic tiles that somebody had does an extra they didn't need or something, or it came out of an old house they didn't want them anymore. And uh, you know, set those things up and the first shot cracks them and then you got four targets and then you shoot them again and now you got eight targets. I may have yeah. to say something to him about that if he's not listening. I'm thinking he's listening though. They can make a mess, I guess, but like I say, for us, it, we're desert and sand and shit, so it just sort of powdered and what we basically left behind was chunks of ceramic. Now, I mean, I know that he has taken like old computers out there, you know, when something has just bit the dust and just they have just like pulverized that. And accidentally, I know he's busted cinder blocks, but that's because he taped Tannerite to something and it was too close to it. So that wasn't on purpose. But. Yeah, but it's still cinder blocks. Yeah, that kind of stuff is boring, actually. When you shoot it, it just puts holes in it. And it's, uh, I mean, if you got your own place and you don't care, it's just your junkyard, go for it. I really think they should open up junkyards to be places for that. But, you know, they don't because it's stupid reasons, I guess. And then what happens is people take you know, dryers and TVs and stuff out to the desert or out to the woods, right, and then do that anyway. But I'm sure at least a chunk of that wouldn't happen if they just said, okay, every Friday at 3 p.m. you can start shooting at the range, right? Or shooting at the dump. Yeah, shooting rats or whatever was out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have those kind of things. Our we used to pay $6 <laughs> in Colorado. You'd pay $6 and only 22 long rifles were allowed. And like if your dad was dumping out stuff out there, they'd always take their kids and you could shoot all the seagulls you wanted for six bucks. Yeah. Like, that was, like, a thing because, like, instead of them using those scare things and tearing up equipment, I guess it's real hard on the equipment and stuff. Like, that was the way they solved the seagull problem there. What, seagull poops or something? It's your jars and... Well, I think, yeah, I think their poop's, like, acidic and stuff, and they make nests in all sorts of places they shouldn't, and, you know, and then spread disease or kind of like flying rats. That's why they're the Utah State bird. You can't touch them here. But in Colorado, you sure could. It was six bucks all day long. There was no limit, no nothing. Just take your son out there with this twenty-two. I don't know if they still do that, but that's how the, um, not the junkyard, but the, the dump. That's the, you know, that's how that was. Back when I was a kid. 
Uh, my grandparents had one behind the the house just because of where they lived and so it was a lot of small stuff but you know the jars and stuff like that that was always something that was was fun as a kid you'd set them up and a lot of reactive targets the other thing that's fun though is bringing somebody new in you know obviously bring them into you know firearm ownership is cool but like today uh, on Rick's chat I actually found a guy that's seen a, one of my videos somewhere on Facebook or something, and he actually joined in on the chat. He's in, I believe he's 32. He's been blind since birth, and he shoots all the time. So it's kind of cool just to meet, you know, people that you would never come across or might not talk about it. That was kind of sweet. And it's so. cool that you got to find each other without having to like both go to some place for shooting mm -hmm. for blind, right? So it's like exactly. out, out in the world doing your thing. Mm -hmm. Now I think the sharing thing is a big part of it. And unlike like um well, I guess I was gonna say unlike camping, but camping is kind of similar, but um maybe unlike uh I don't know, trying to think of something that's less consequential, learning how to change your oil, although that's kind of useful too. But uh, unlike some skills, you know, like you say, you're showing somebody something that's could be ultimately interesting for them. And if they're not interested, at least it's giving them like awareness of a pretty big political issue. And then ideally, you, you're a good ambassador and you invite somebody in and show them the ropes and they become an ad, uh, kind of enthusiast and then an advocate. So unlike uh, showing somebody how to make the perfect grilled cheese with mayonnaise or some kind of goofy lasagna in a crock pot um which is crazy um instead of something like that what you're actually doing is bringing in hopefully somebody aware are you bringing somebody into the awareness of uh something a, a right that's at risk which i don't i think that's neat you know bringing somebody into something that's actually has a little bit more meaning than like i say different flavor of popcorn or, I don't know, i'm trying to think of stuff that doesn't matter different type of syrup for pancakes Uh, was that the guy that was in Gary's early bird chat the other day? With GT food center? No, this this is uh, this was his first first live show. Uh, I, mean, I won't mention his name because I think he's he's going to pick a cool name because it's just his regular name. But um, he was on the shooting with disabilities tonight. But he had just threw a comment out. Um, a couple days ago, and I just, you know, commented back, said, "Hey, you know, that's cool. You want to jump in?" And next thing you know, he's going to be joining gun channels and running the show. So you brought up the idea of um, teaching or introducing somebody but again learning i think is that's all kind of the same thing right um or two different sides of the same thing because at some time you learned from someone who was teaching you and then uh but taking the learning um i don't know you all kind of a couple of you said learning so you're coming at it from different angles i think but for me i just i'm I, I think it's neat, like whenever I discovered that Colt is the one who's responsible for interchangeable parts and not stupid Eli Whitney who always gets the credit, um, I just found that to be super interesting, right? That uh, guns are responsible for interchangeable parts, which are responsible for the Industrial Revolution, which is responsible for the world we have today, right? Um, that's kind of neat. And that's not something you, that you're going to learn in school. And it's available to be found. I didn't find some secret book or whatever I just looked around and found like three or four things that say yeah that's the way it is and um you know the only thing I have going the other way is our old textbooks and maybe a museum or something that if you read the museum thing it'll kind of say you know uh it'll kind of allude to the fact that uh Eli Whitney used interchangeable parts but not that he created the concept Uh, but anyway, so we're talking about different types of learning. So again, I think that uh, there's the gun itself. There's the rules, like carrying it and stuff. There's the hunting side of it. There's sports. I mean, come on, there's a billion rules for different sports. 
uh, there's just learning what all the different sports are. Yeah, then you get into like history and then laws and stuff. So, I mean, I don't know where all where you all were coming at with from the learning aspect. Was there any way to spin off on that one anymore? <laughs> Because I say for me, learning learning for me is is probably different from the guys because I mean they've been in it forever and so they know everything and me I mean I just recently learned how to tear down my firearms and clean them. That's huge because I don't ever have to ask anybody to do that for me again. That's a big deal. Plus, I was able to share it on the internet on YouTube, on GunStreamer, um, and other people can watch that and learn too and say, hey, I can do this by myself too. Or the fact that, you know, I come in here and I get a little five-minute lesson from my husband on how to shoot a firearm, and then I go out and I do it myself. Flaws and all, you know, my mistakes and all, I've put all of that out there because that's part of it, you know saying, hey, you can do this too. Yes, you may make mistakes, but knowing the basic rules of firearm safety, even the small mistakes I've made, I'm still safe. And I'm still having fun. Yeah, and I would say, I, I like to use the guitar analogy a lot, but it's unlike a musical instrument where you have to either, I mean, you have to either somehow be touched or something to like just be able to pick up a musical instrument and play it. Like that's a little tougher, but maybe it's more like a paintbrush. Like you can go buy anybody can go buy a paintbrush and paints or whatever. Anybody can go buy some chalk or markers or something. And you know, I imagine once you bought some some kind of art thing, you could probably go nuts trying to figure out all the different ways you could use it. And you could definitely go to an art class or some sort of uh, instruction, right? You could get somebody who knows what they're doing to show you what's, what their tips and tricks are. But when it comes right down to it, it's you and the paintbrush and the paints and the canvas and whatever you feel like doing, right? So um, you can either go nuts and try to do some sort of formal, you know, professional, sellable art right off the bat, or you could just play around, or you could uh, teach a kid right off the bat. Like, so I think guns are one of those things where... There's no rules. When you said um, that uh, when you when you talk about learning, it feels like everybody else knows everything already. I mean, I guess depending on how long you've been around something, you might feel like you know something. But think about like all the stuff that existed pre-2000, like except for maybe a 1022 and a, a bolt action rifle. And a, there's very few guns that are the same from back then, like pretty much in the 2000s, everything switched. And then when you get into the 2000s to now, that's 19 years of evolution. So anything people might have had from when they're kids or from a long time ago is pretty much not applicable except for generalities. And then the ways that things have been focused and refined, um, there's there's learning for everybody. I mean, there's, you can be content in what you know, but to actually be up on top of stuff, you'd have to. I mean, I don't even know if it's possible for everybody to really know everything or even a lot anymore, right? And that's like hearing something about, you know, a foreign firearm and, you know, military stuff, you know, you might just hear it and, you know, in, in passing or something. And then you, you know, do some research or whatever. And the next thing you know, you've got a whole collection of them. That's, that's, that's what I like. I like, you know, we're looking at, at some things and just getting kind of a, a brief overview. And the next thing you know, it's, it's a, an obsession. It's always fun. And then you're learning, you know, a lot more stuff than, you know, what's just local or in your region, too. Any other my 2A is fun or how is 2A fun? So we did people, kind of did learning a couple of different ways. We did new guns and sharing, traveling. Um, I think that's I, true, right? Because traveling with a CCW for the first time is pretty effing neat. And then just traveling and knowing that you're, you know, you're you're good to go is certainly a you know, what's the word? Like a more comfortable mind, you know, confident. comfortable trip, confident trip. Yeah. Open carry too.
Oh, you just mean uh, going out and open carrying is like a thing, like having fun with it? Yeah, it's kind of liberating. Yeah, it can be fun, especially, uh, again, going to like, I mean, I know people are going to have different opinions on it, but I've been to two pro-gun rallies in Phoenix already where I guess it was probably encouraged at the one to wear a rifle. At least it wasn't if it was encouraged, but certainly in the description of the, the event, it said like if you're going to wear long or wear your long arms uh, slung, something like that. So it wasn't necessarily like bring your long arms, but just, hey, if you're going to wear them slung. And then uh, the second time, they didn't really mention it, but both times people showed up. And uh, I don't know. I guess if you've never done it or you have no interest at all in doing it, then I guess go do whatever you want. But it is certainly an interesting experience to go around with a bunch of people having lung guns slung. And it's not a violent thing. It's just a liberating free thing, I guess. It's sort of like want to wear sandals. Awesome. And like yeah. wearing sandals and a bunch of people get together for a sandal wearing event, right? It's just fun to get around, you know, have a... You an almost experience. feel like the power really is in the people's hands when you're doing that, when you're at a protest and, you know, you're open carrying and, uh, you know, like you, you definitely feel like you make a more impact on your statement and, you know, you're exercising your right and uh, people are going to see that. Those, those politicians that you're specifically protesting, I mean, they do take notice of that. I really believe that. And they notice a difference between, oh, is this just a bunch of guys just out there? Or is this, oh, look at all those guys with, like, guns slung over their shoulder? I think that makes a, a, a huge statement. I think that falls in with, with achievements, too. You know, you, you set, you know, goals and everything. And part of having fun is, you know, those long-range shots or doing the open carry. You know, there's there's all sorts of things that you know once you set your goals and stuff that obviously it's fun to achieve them i'd say entertainment is part of fun in 2a you know um the entertainment whether it, i guess be movies or uh music or whatever all sorts of different brands of entertainment firearms and guns have been mixed into because it's part of our history and our heritage and part of our culture so you know not all of them necessarily show it in the best light but some of them do some of them are just for fun and stuff and so i enjoy the entertainment side that when i see guns and movies and tv shows or whatnot uh, even if uh you know the guy's not necessarily like the most proficient gun handler and stuff like that i i don't always care about those details sometimes it's funny watching them mess up or do something weird watching them firing blanks and the gun's not recoiling at all. And it's a 44 mag or something, you know, stuff like that. It's neat to notice that stuff. I was going to mention that, you know, making fun of those guys that don't know what they're doing. Yeah. yeah and like, uh, uh, you know, like how silencers aren't silent, like in the movies and how, you know, guns don't like pick people off the, uh, up in the air and like, you know, throw them 12 feet back and, you know, you learn a lot of stuff when you start going out shooting and stuff, right? Compared to what the movies show. So I don't know. Sometimes it's fun to poke fun at that stuff and just, you know, laugh at it. And other times it's like, you know, guys do a really good job and they'll have, uh, what do they call them? Like, the, you know, the trainers or whatever on set that really know what they're doing, that train the actors in a really good way. And have, they have, you know, pretty proficient skills. And so, you know, I can appreciate the movies that do try and make the effort extra effort of like, Hey, let's make our gun handling and stuff realistic, right? Let's make our actors and, and actresses go get some training before this movie. And let's, I appreciate films that are doing that. Cause then I'm hoping if those actors were maybe like, let's say a, uh, an anti-gun actor or something, or they had an anti-gun stance, but now they got to take this movie part that involves them with guns and they go get this training. I'm hoping that's all it takes, like, or maybe that kind of sways them over a little bit or makes them think a little bit differently. Because I know that's the big thing is like taking people shooting the first time, like a lot of the anti-gun people have just never fired a gun. They've just never been around it, haven't been out shooting. So they have this certain expectation and this like fantasy idea of guns. And then when you finally take them shooting, they're like, oh, this isn't quite what I expected it was going to be like. And this is like way different and this is fun and this is cool. So I've seen that firsthand. So I, th I hope that maybe some of these anti-gun movie stars, when they get, you know, when they get onto a movie that is taking the extra steps like that, 
and they go to somebody's training class like Taryn Butler or something, I'm hoping he's also educating them on 2A, not just, oh, here's how you hold the gun. I'm hoping he's throwing in some 2A stuff there and, you know, some gun right stuff. I don't know. Wouldn't you think, I don't know that much about Hollywood, but everybody says Canoe Reeves is such a good dude. Like in real life, he's like a good guy. If that's the case and he's going around Hollywood making these big movies and stuff, you would think that actors and directors, whatever the hell is involved, would know that he's a good dude. And then he's over there digging the training, right? The gun training and being good or whatever. That's got to have some sort of, uh, um, what am I trying to say? Like, it's got to get through to him, right? Like, to some extent. Yeah, you know, like, you know, if they're sitting there maybe trying to badmouth someone at some fancy Hollywood party, you're like, oh, guns are bad. Like, only bad people own guns. And someone could say, like, what about Keanu Reeves? Right. It's oh, easy to go, like, oh, John Wayne, he's dead. He's a jerk. He's a Republican or something. Like, he's a big jerk. But, like, yeah. What about Canoe? All right. I so. Just so maybe it changes a couple of their minds or makes them think differently about it. You know, I that gives me some hope thinking that. So if you watch the documentary, real documentary called Milius about John Milius, the guy that did Conan and um, Dirty Harry and Apocalypse Now and um, Red Dawn and a couple other movies, right? Um, that guy went to school with with Spielberg and Coppola and Lewitt and all those guys all went to school together for film school and they all hung out with each other and if you listen to that document if you watch that documentary called Milius it'll I'm pretty sure it was in that movie they have uh, kind of a interviews with Spielberg and the other guys as part of the you know talking back or going thinking back about this guy and he would take those guys out to shoot shotgun recreationally because that was one of his interests and it wasn't something that they did but they did it because he did it and because of that indiana jones all these other movies have guns that are you know they're a lot more familiar with guns where who knows what kind of craziness an uneducated unaware uninterested director might have done you know to perpetuate bullshit or something where i think god uh, well i mean it's not like indiana jones is a big gun movie but i think it was a pro-gun you know, overall, it was like a positive gun movie, right? And Star Wars and everything, like those are all, they're not anti-gun movies. So I think there is value to one or two of these Hollywood people uh, being cool. Woods jumped in. We're talking about what makes 2A fun. And I'm going to let you stew on that while, I don't know if you've been listening or I'll let you stew on that while I go look at some of the chats out there. On the gun channel side, uh, DTP was saying about knives that mechanically they're not as uh, fancy, but usefulness and is, is the value is the similar. I, I agree. Then on the uh, YouTube side, been chatting for a bit. Um, user was saying that his uh, 2A is bond to him and his dad. Uh, Dad was able to teach him not only how to shoot, but how to be accurate, and that's feel his love of guns in the 2A. And uh, then he's gotten into 2A, plinking and fell in love with that. And now, thanks to Clover Tech, he's getting into black powder. And that's, you know, kind of like a sports, I guess, or something. Like once you're in, or like instruments, like once you're into it, you could appreciate the next instrument and master it if you want, or play with it or experiment with it. And uh, I think in that way, 2A is pretty fun. We got billion avenues to get into. Literally, I don't. Th I haven't discovered them all, and I've been trying to pay attention to them for decades. Literally trying to get a grasp on it all, and it's it's awesome. You still find new things all the time, and then new things get created. Uh, then they're saying a bunch of weird things, and then somebody said something. We were talking about traveling. And then somebody said something in the chat, and I didn't want to interrupt whoever was talking. But one of my favorite things is gun shows, and those are completely unique. You know, their gun shows basically a, a swap meet, except for guns. But you know, they have a legal definition so that FFLs are only able to do business in their brick and mortar and at gun shows. Gun shows are under attack. Gun shows are like traditional, and I mean, I could go on and on and on. But I think. One of my funnest things, things that keeps me interested in finding new stuff and new people 
these gun shows and then just going to different gun shows is just as fun as going to different gun shops which i guess could be a whole nother similar branch of this one but what do you think of gun shows to me it's like mining for gold like i'm like i'm looking for that you know either a very specific thing or i'm just looking for that one thing that i knows like either worth it might be worth a lot just to me or it might be worth a lot of money right it could be either or for me but i'm looking for like you know like the gold like a needle in a haystack type stuff so i enjoy looking through everyone's case and bins and stuff like that yeah i used to love going but now it's i i, I have to filter through who i actually go with so that they know what i'm looking for because if you go with just somebody you know, and you, you ask for a certain thing, you know, they they tend not to know what you're talking about. I tend to go those knowing that I'm looking for one thing and then lo and behold, there's three other things that I absolutely have to have, but I'm pretty good about not spending a lot of money, but um, it's always interesting on what you intended to get and what you end up with are not necessarily the same thing. Now let's remember they're called gun shows and not gun sales because yeah. they're designed to be a get together, right? So you've usually got the promoter who has some sort of a table that'll have at least their own promotions, like their own other gun shows, or maybe if they do other kind of events, they'll have their promotions. Uh, but typically there you'll find any nonprofits, any gun owners rights groups, uh, sometimes politicians, depending on the promoter, you know, they'll either take politician stuff or not, or political stuff or not. Uh, you'll find things for uh, maybe auctions or raffles for um, like 4-H and scouts and kids groups that might be doing, any kind of kids groups that might be doing gun stuff. You might find uh, a new range uh, that's getting built or that's, you know, there's trying to get interest on a new range or something. Uh, training opportunities, guides, you know, there's all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, but then, and that's just at the table where you find out, you know, about the shows or, or find it by a table. Uh, then you've got uh, people that, mo not every show, but a lot, most promoters will have something like a, an opportunity for a table, either low cost or cheaper or free sometimes. If you're just going to show off your collection or you're just going to do a demo table. And that's a thing about gun shows that's kind of been lost over the years. And I barely remember the days when there would be like a real emphasis on that part of it where maybe somebody brought in their collection of this or that or a couple of people came together and created the ultimate collection of some aspect right uh and then the just shitting and shooting the shit you know having a, a an entire day or two days where you can uh, have people walk up and discover something have little kids see what it's like there's there's something about seeing an entire collection of thompson's or you know every single poker gun um Anybody that's been to the NRA annual meetings and gone over to the 20% of the floor space, 20% of the real estate that they devote to nonprofits, gun owners rights groups, areas of interest, going to see like miniatures or even like a Civil War cannon collection. That kind of stuff is just neat. And it's not a museum. It, it lets you know that it's just individuals who are participating in the community and, and sharing their, their interest and bringing, you know, this, the gun show is the excuse to bring everything together. Uh, and then you just get to shoot the shit. So... If gun shows suck in your area, you know, it's easy to say, but uh, consider getting a table and just setting up a table to shoot shit or maybe sell some stuff out of the, the gun room and uh, an opportunity to meet people in your area. Uh, when you see somebody at a gun show who's maybe selling AK parts or AR gizmos or stuff for a toke rod or something, and then six months later, you get a toke rod or an AK or an AK-40 or an AR or whatever happens to be. The gun show was your... In, it was your uh, awareness that those people are there. Now you have something to look forward to at the next gun show, or if you took their card, maybe you can meet up with them at their location or uh, however they do business between shows. Um, and again, there's there's so much to do at gun shows. It's uh, if we think of them as simply uh, places to buy stuff cheap, then we're selling them and uh, the opportunity show. Yeah, I really enjoyed them as a kid. You know, that was that was one of the big things, you know, the, those weekends going, and, you know, you, you could pick up old military medals and just different things that, you know, caught your eye that were cheap enough for a kid to pick up. But, you know, looking at all the, you know, the different things and, you know, hearing well, the little I, guy I found, stuff, I found stuff at the gun shows that I can't find on eBay. 
I can't find at my local gun store. Like you can only get that stuff at gun shows. You know, there's a lot of custom stuff, like custom, like woodworking guys and stock guys and just, you know, this custom gunsmiths and just stuff like there's stuff that you can only get at certain gun shows. So I really enjoy that aspect of it. And obviously the networking is, is huge too. You know, just getting getting that that book of business cards is is huge. So that you know, when you do pick up something later, you know, hey, I can call this guy. In my family, it's super fun to take my dad and my brother, and then his son, so my dad's grandson, and just watching the interaction of the different generations uh, walking around, and my dad, you know, telling about back in the farm. You know, the key had some similar thing. And then my nephew probably never heard that story before. And, you know, you can make a real good day of it. What else are we missing? We had to write a book about how fun the Second Amendment is. Are we allowed to talk about the words? The, 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 how intertwined firearms are into our vocabulary and our language, really. Our whole language, really. Yeah, like son of a gun on the target. We have a bunch of idioms that are oh. firearm related. So, oh, has the gun been hunting yet? Oh, is that fun? Killing things? Murdering or innocent animals? Fun? It totally is. <laughs> It depends yeah. on if you're eating them or not. Well, but yeah, going out and I mean, there's certain, there's all different kinds of ways to hunt or whatever, but yeah, going out and be, doing the hunt or whatever is certainly, uh, I don't know what you call it. It's more than fun because a it's, rite of passage. Yeah, it's, it's, it's got more significance than that, I'd say. But then when you get past the actual like hunting part of it, you just get to the experience part, like the, not just the camaraderie, because you get tons of friends that go hunting, but then, like they're saying, with uh, handing down from generation to generation, the, the hunting skills and tradition, uh, again, that has so much more significance than fun. I don't, I mean, it is fun, yes, but I think it's fun plus, right? Like plus, 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 or something. I think that definitely hunting's a big one. Well, of course, the second man has not new hunting, but it's certainly an extra nice benefit that we get from it. And you're in the outdoors, too. Well, yeah, that's the whole thing, right? You're, you're hunting in a zoo, doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, you're getting crushed. <laughs> so I appreciate the two super chats out there, you guys partner on whatever. But uh, we do have the Indiegogo thing going. Uh, the idea there is to inspire a bunch of people to throw two bucks. Imagine if a uh, thousand people threw two bucks at me. Uh, I'd have one, you know, I'd basically have, uh, I'd be able to wake up and work on 2A stuff from now till a gun rights policy if uh, 2,000 people threw two bucks at me. And at four thousand bucks, I'd be able to work without my hands tied behind my back for pretty much two months. Um, so, no, not desperate. I'm not suggesting you do anything uh, that's outside of your comfort zone. Uh, we've got lots of campaigns out there, uh, but this two uh, A history campaign that I've got going is an effort to uh, have uh, an open uh, fundraising thing going right up into the gun rights policy. There's plenty of people that I'd like to see at the gun rights policy, and I hope you would too. People like uh, Jared. Guns and Gadgets, right? Liberty Doll, I think, would be great there. I don't know if she has the ability to get there. Uh, Tony Simon, I don't know if it's a no-brainer for him to get there. I know he'd like to get there. Uh, so there's all kinds of people, and those are just three people I have off the top of my head. But imagine if I sat down and thought about it, and if I had a chance to contact people and say, how are you, are you going? Uh, I'd like to think that uh, we could mobilize some uh, some funding to get people to the rights policy. So I'm not suggesting I'm doing that, but if this thing gets enough money, I'll certainly help people get there. But really, it's just an effort to uh, let people know about the crowdfunding. And as we get closer to the gun rights policy, I'm hoping to uh, use this as a way to uh, let some of the others who aren't in our YouTube circle and our Internet circle, even uh, people that write or that uh, uh, use voice like on radio or something for them to realize that some of these tools we have online um, might, not, it might not just fund their projects. But once we can get some people into the concept of crowdfunding, weaponizing our wallets, I think that we have a much better opportunity going into 2020 with a bunch of people who are uh, um, 
and able to uh, spend more time thinking about their projects. So whatever, if anybody wants to uh, participate, I dropped a link over there. And again, I don't expect the couple of people that watch this show can't even thumb it up. You don't have the money to thumb it up. I can't expect you to, uh, to fund it, but I would ex uh, appreciate and uh, value anybody who can help share that because that's really where the, the gold is in this whole social media world is the sharing. You never know when somebody's going to see it, uh, think it's a great idea and share it to the person who you know is my sugar mama out there who's got a bunch of money and thinks that uh, you know seven thousand dollars going to this project is totally worth it and then you were part of that so being with sugar mamas drop them the link and if you don't just drop the link out there desperately all the time until people are like why do you keep dropping this link i mean that's too much um but anyway so that was a little commercial there do we have anything else to talk about how is 2a fun I really enjoy taking my friends that are non-gunners that I've talked into, you know, giving it a shot and just look, look, look on their face because I've yet to have one that didn't come back and say, this is awesome. Like, does other people know about this? And just that's a, a lot of fun on its own. I'm sure other people have done similar things. You kind of touched on it earlier, G, about it being, you know, like a mechanical device that you can take apart and work on and stuff like that. But it's something you can, you know, as long like you got to, you know, be careful, but it's something you can customize too. And like that you can actually really work on. Like, you know, like you said, most people aren't building motors in their garage and stuff like that. And that takes a bunch more tools and room. And, you know, you have to, you know, but it's something, you know, you can rebuild a gun and do a customize a gun and do all sorts of neat stuff to a gun on your kitchen table with minimal tools. So, you know, to get people, you know, into mechanical stuff and get them thinking and using their brain and learning new stuff. I really like that. The one thing I like is the, the collection part of it, you know, if you get your CNR or any of that kind of stuff, but you know, collecting always sounds like it's got high dollars attached to it. You know, the, the idea that you can go and you can pick up the things that are, you know, uh, feel great or whatever that, that are not the high dollar, pretty, you know, museum quality or the snooty guy down the road, you know, what would be in his collection where you get the broke stuff and, and that mechanical stuff where you can fix it or you can, you know, spend all that extra time searching out where you're going to find, you know, this part or see who can actually, you know, recreate a part that's, you know, hasn't been made in, you know, 70 years or something. Um, and then it's always cool to get those emails of, you know, when you, you start searching out all those places that, that, uh, you know, distribute or they carry those firearms or they pick up collections, you know, randomly and you'll get a, you know, a email out of the blue that says, Hey, you know, we have, you know, X rifles and whatever, you know, it's kind of nice to, you know, do that searching too, because then it's better than watching, you know, cat videos or, whatever else that, you know, people waste their time on. It, it's satisfying finding that stuff and then, you know, getting a CNR and having stuff actually shipped to you without, you know, all that extra nonsense is kind of cool. You know, you get the, the parts and whatever and make up a collection and then you can pass it on because then it's something that you can talk about to other people too. Memories. Memories make it fun too. Memories of like running around the neighborhood shooting each other with like, you know, cap guns and playing army and, you know, guns being a part of your child, my childhood at least and stuff like the memories. You know, I'd say that makes it a lot of fun. Unless you're Dano. Apologize, anybody was triggered. <laughs> uh, is it worth? concentrating on the fun part once in a while. That's what I kind of thought tonight instead of always worrying about this or a lot of doom and gloom out there. Um, is it worth looking at the fun? Is it trivial? Does it, what's the word? Does it like trivialize it, I guess, to, uh, to talk about how fun it is? Or is it like too important a uh, topic to let the secret out that it's super fun? That could get into some deep stuff there. That's what the show's all about. That's why most people can't hang with this show. They, they, they run from it. I think I think the fun has 
a lot to do with it. I think we definitely need to maybe talk about that more. Like if it wasn't if it wasn't enjoyable, we wouldn't be doing it, right? Going deep. The meaning of life is to have fun. Like no one like you to have a good time, to have fun, to enjoy life, right? And to me, that's the meaning of life. Like what it boils down to, because there's like usually like no other emotion that you're like, oh, I want to do just do that instead. Like everyone wants to have fun, everyone wants to have a good time, they all want to laugh, they all want to be happy. So to me, that's the meaning of life. So yeah, like that's involved in guns. That's involved in everything we do. It should be anyway. And everything you do that you love to do or enjoy. If you're not having fun at it, then why are you doing it? I can't think I, I can't agree enough. And I think that if by not talking about the fun aspect, then we look robotic, right? We look odd if we don't understand or something or like we're weird. I think Seems talking weird. about I think talking about the positive and the fun aspect of it <clears throat> will attract more people that aren't those negative Nancy's because there are people that are just they don't like all that negative and once you hit that negative and this is what's bad this is what's wrong this is what we need to fix they just kind of shut down and they don't want to hear it anymore but if we're talking about the fun stuff what it's going to get them excited and bring other people in that we might not bring in otherwise yeah, and then why would anybody stick around to see all the different flavors when the first flavor they experienced was nag, 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 or like, here's the way to do it, period, or something? Right. I mean, if you, there are days that if you turn turn on the chats or, or go through the shows, everything is negative. We need to burn this down. We need to start over. We need to redo this. They're out to get us. Da, 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 da. Well, I mean, after a long day of work and you've had a rough day, who wants to come and listen to a bunch of the negative stuff? I mean, why not have positive stuff out there for people to to find? As a large channel, I feel like I should backpedal. I shouldn't even be talking about this subject. I can talk about the fun part, but none of the negative part. How do you what percentage of a project should be devoted to fun or what percentage of a project should you allow to possibly touch fun for it to be valid? Uh, Dead Horse, what percentage of fun in your projects? 95%. Patriot. I, I'd say a good 75%. I mean, you have to have some, some meat in there, but yeah. Fun is always be positive. Uh, Woods? I'm going to go 91%. Oh, we're trying to go to the thing without going over? <laughs> Hold on. Uh, Armentia, how much fun? Percentage-wise. Fall asleep? Just hanging out with Clover. She fell asleep. No, I no, I muted. <laughs> I was gonna say on my personal channel, I think most all of mine is fun. I I don't. Well, I take that back. Probably ninety. Yeah, except for the editing. <laughs> well, you gotta think about it though, because I mean, it it's all positive. I mean, there's really nothing that you're negative. I mean, I guess you throw out stuff if if there's a a bad bill or something like that. But I mean, if, if you're talking about firearms or you're, you know, I mean, I, I think it, it's probably even more than that. I'll, I'll say 96 because dead horse is 95, right? I'll yeah. add a dollar to that. So 96. So everybody put pretty high percentage. Let me ask this. What is the opposite of if we're saying, how is two a fun? Then <clears throat> What would be the other side of it? If, if, if fun is, you know, if fun, the two A is sixty percent fun. What's the what's the opposite of fun? I don't know if that's the way to say it. But what's the opposite of fun? I think Dead Horse said, like, or no, Patriot said meat. Yeah, th th there's, I mean, there's things that that have to be done because, you know, uh, legal wise, I guess, 
But you have to bring up things that that might be negative, I guess. And it's hard to throw a a, a fun spin on a you know a, a bad bill or something. So I mean, you know, when you're, you're talking about things that that are trying to be motivating, I guess you know you want to always stay positive, or I always do. But I, I don't know. I don't know what they're you know. What is there? I mean, most most things about firearms, our rights and our liberties, that, that, that is fun. I mean, it is a right and it's serious, but just because something's I'm serious... Sure guys bring humor into it. Like, they're, they do, yeah. they're talking about anti-gun bills and even making fun of some, you know, anti-gun politician or something. But they, like, they do it with humor and stuff like that and not with... So it's, it's up to the individual person, I think. Some of us, it affects differently than others, and some of us, it just doesn't, like... We have a hard time striking that funny bone at all in the, when it's like something like our rights being threatened, right? So I think it's just, it's that's probably like a a, a, a person thing. And, and also with the with the being, you know, the, the fun part, you know, that's all all that includes safety and all the rules and and how to handle things. Because just because things are fun doesn't mean that they're not serious. They're not, you know, substantial. I think. So, again, it's tough to say what the opposite of fun is, but um, I guess I was going to say, it depend I don't think there's an answer. My answer is there's no answer because there's some people that are no fun. There's just some people that don't have a funny bone or they just don't see the point. And... They're not unique. They're not the only ones out there. So if we had content that was all super fun, you know what I mean? It would never reach those people. So I think there is no correct answer. I think everybody should do whatever they're going to do. But I think what uh, Patriot said would be my theory personally is that no matter what you're doing, I think what Patriot said, no matter what you're doing, you can have fun with it. I mean, honestly, if you're, if, if I had the ability and it was my thing because i i've watched some people guys from minnesota there's guys in um washington state there's some people in florida or california watch the fpc people they they i wouldn't say they're getting a thrill but they certainly i think appreciate that they're part of it all by going to dc and going to their state legislatures and uh speaking up and helping to organize groups of people that come to show support in unity and numbers. And I mean, that's the system, that's freedom. That's what keeps the world from falling into chaos is the, the, the individuals that participate in the system. And uh, sure, some people can't and some people won't and some people would, but you know, whatever, but whatever. Uh, taking a camera along and seeing that I mean, nobody took a camera along when the five dudes sat down in Phoenix at the, I keep saying Waffle House, although I think it's someplace else, and uh, decided to start the AZCDL. And then a few years later, when they got constitutional carry, there was still no cameras. I, I'm, I apologize because I could have been the camera guy for that. I just didn't you know, know it was happening to do it. Like an idiot. But uh, anyway, uh, there was no cameras then. So we don't have that. We could literally, you know, when these laws, when these court cases are going through when these uh, McDonald or uh, Heller, you know, the equivalents of those happen in the future, that can be documented. That could be a, a, an online series, right? Like that could, people could participate and it might not be like shooting a gun at something that's a reactive target, but I got to tell you, I could care less watching some people shoot at a reactive target. I understand that they're having a great time, especially if it's somebody who's not shot a lot before. But to watch someone who's older than me, who shot more reactive targets than me, shoot a reactive target, I could give a crap. I could care less, right? Like, I don't care that it's happening, but I also don't care that there's a cat show. You know, it doesn't bother me that there's a cat show. I just have no interest in it. That doesn't bother me that some guy wants to shoot steel targets every single week, and they're the same steel targets, and he just shoots a different gun. Like, that is ultimately interesting to millions of people, I guess. But you know what I'm saying? There's, there's, each of us have our own thing. And if somebody can be part of the system and share that, I think that's uh, an aspect of fun. And, and again, it might not be fun for everybody, but the people that think it's fun, man, that's awesome. 
And, uh, and if that can inspire somebody, instead of like, hey, you could get a place and do the same thing over and over again many times. Uh, you know, that's a different thing for somebody who has a different thirst. Getting into the to the political side of it. Or maybe it's the same thing with safety or training or instructing. Um, so, you know, if you're just taking your camera along, I guess, as a, over my shoulder, sharing my experience with the world, any of that could be fun. Look at Dustin when he goes and does his youth camps and stuff. I don't think he ever doesn't have fun, right? He would probably have fun doing his taxes. He's just a fun type of person who has a positive outlook on the world. I think that ties in with that small group thing that that's you've been talking about the last last several days. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'll probably, I, I should probably remember the guy's name of the book, but it was yeah one of these books I've been listening to. Thanks to Angry. Because yeah, if if you have all these different small groups and everybody does their own fun thing, I mean, it pretty much as long as you have a lot of those small groups, it's going to overlap everything. You know, it's going to cover everything because just because you know i like to you know do something that you know dead horse doesn't or whatever um you know our two groups overlap and all that kind of stuff and i think it, it pushes us you know in one direction a lot better you know not to tie it in with innovation and stuff but that's anything else one, two, eight. What is the least fun thing about the two way? Dead horse. Trolls. So the community itself, or people that have access to the community at least, or fair weather. Uh, awareness, I mean, you want to call them anything because owning property doesn't make you nothing, right? So just people that are have access that come in to disrupt for the sake of breaking glass? Yep, exactly. 100% nail on the head. And then don't see any consequences to that. If they're satisfied, there are no consequences. There's, there's, if they have, aren't aware, then they're, they, they don't need to be worried. They stifle exactly. somebody else from making a comp or getting joining the conversation, or they, uh, anyway. So, yeah, so that's, a, that's an interesting one. Patriot, worst part about two way, just the guys that that complain a lot and don't do anything. Is that basically what you were just just saying? You know, the guys that 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 scream and, and shout and then they basically go and watch TV or something. I think that's different. Dead Horse, I think, is talking about people that could be put an actual same amount of effort. It's going to take me 10 minutes today to wiggle my fingers and affect change in the world through my internet screen. And they decide I'm going to do that against somebody who's trying to do something valuable or useful because I don't like something that they did once or I'm like obsessed with that. Oh, okay. And you're saying somebody who like is satisfied to own a gun and they go to the range, but when it comes time to donate, they're like, yeah, but that movie's coming out on DVD and I've only seen it at the movie theater twice. And I have the Blu-ray, but if I'm going to take the DVD to the to the vacation home, then I don't want to take the Blu-ray because I don't have a Blu-ray there yet. So that guy who doesn't decide to do nothing, but he's still a gun owner, quote unquote. Well, that or the ones that just go in and, and, and complain about anything and everything and how everybody's doing stuff, but they don't, you know, that's all they do is the complaining part. They don't give any options. They don't. They don't try to work to do anything. It's more of just, uh, you know, oh, this is horrible. Oh, that guy's bad. Oh, they're taking my rights. Oh, whatever. And scream. Well, and I, I hear that one. I don't know if anybody else is going to say that one, but just to throw something out there, I listened to today actually was um, somebody was saying how he was at a place. In fact, I played this on the uh, two-way workshop that I had earlier today. So if anybody, the five people that were there, will this is a rerun. But he was basically saying he was at some auditorium or, you know, had an audience. He was doing a speak, speech with some other. He was opening up for some other guy who was better than him. And uh, he said his whatever he was going to say. And then the other guy did his thing. And then later they were talking after offstage. And he asked him, you know, how were you not distracted by that guy in the third row who was asleep? And the guy answered, well, it wasn't for him. Like this, this 
for whatever reason, that guy decided to show up and fall asleep. But our message was for the other 99,000 people in that fucking room. So I hear what you're saying, and that can be frustrating because they'll come to the party and shit on the carpet. But remember that you put the party out there for the other 97 people that appreciated it, and a bunch of them helped clean up the carpet, and the rest of them just had a good time, and they go live great lives, and they don't live to shit on people's carpets, right? And that's uh, something we all have to deal with. Our goal, I guess, as humans is to try to appeal to as many people as possible to not cause problems, and people realize that they can come in and manipulate that by shitting on the carpet and standing there and looking at you. And we just have to get used to understanding that the other people in the party are there too. And that, that one individual's trying to manipulate for whatever desperate issues they've got going on, right? And it's not our job is to be their therapist, I don't think. So if we can get on and move past it, then the shitting on the carpet isn't the main thing of the party. But instead, the cool dance somebody came up with or the fact that somebody got engaged or whatever the hell the party was there for in the first place, right? So if we allow the carpet shitters to set the pace, then that's our bad, right? They're going to happen no matter what. And maybe they're sent by Bloomberg. And how bad would it be if we get discouraged every time Bloomberg sends a carpet shitter over? Buzz a patch. Uh, except I won't do it. I, I think I know somebody who would not be against putting a carpet shitter patch out there. Um, <laughs> Woods. Worst part about the 2A. Um, the constant bombardment from most media um, trying to change the culture to be anti-gun because it's just it's everywhere it's all the time and but we don't really want to get too far into that topic but oh I guess all topics but yeah that's a good one because it's not like you know those motorcycles they'll be like hey don't wear that helmet or if you don't wear that helmet you're you're hurting society but there's no like constant bombardment against motorcycles. Maybe smoking? Is it as bad as smoking, or do you think smokers have it worse, or gun owners have it worse? What if you're a smoking gun owner? Well, I know. That's what I'm saying. And then I get, both. I get both. Where we're, where we're at with gun owners is what smoking was maybe 20 years ago, when it was under attack, and all everywhere was going no smoking, you know, no smoking restaurants, and I mean, that's, that's where we're at now with guns, is like from the media. Every city's making anti-smoking bills and anti-no smoking and like, you know, 30 feet within doors. And that's like, yeah, like we're at that point now with guns. Armentia, what's the worst thing about 2A? Uh, for me as a female, I think it's the fact that I fit kind of in the middle and not on either end of the spectrum. So... I kind of fall under the radar. Um, for me, that's a challenge. Kind of really sucks. Kind of like being a female football player, like, or even a probably, a, I'm not a sports thing, but probably a fan either, right? Like most of it's 100%, well, 90% male or something or more. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, you either have to be hardcore and pee at the sink somehow or like, uh, yeah, or... But it, it, it's changing at least, right? You're not. It is, uh, it, it is changing, and and you can see it. It's still really frustrating, though, because like I tell people all the time, you've got the tactical badass female, and then you've got the gun bunny, and here I am in the middle. I don't create a bunch of waves. I'm not controversial. I don't show a lot of skin. I don't fall on either side. I don't get on and rant and cuss and carry on on live shows. That sounds more like a normal person. That's why, that's why, that's why I'm not followed a whole lot. That's why it's even harder to get in because there are women that all they have to do is hold the gun and have hardly any clothes and their channel would surpass mine if they made it today by tomorrow. Well, but if you're talking just, you're talking subscribers and whatever any anything like that subscribers um i don't know i've seen it change though so from from shot show to even to nra there was a difference um the way some of the what am i thinking um uh, 
some of the industry would look at certain females and stuff. And then going to NRA, you'd take a, a particular body type or whatever, and you'd have one and they would kind of look over them to look for something more. Am I making sense? Yeah. So uh, the thing is now as a mom, a grandmom, I guess, and a nurse, a lady, wife, and uh, just a gun owner, would you watch like the booby channel or the giggly channel or the like, I don't know what this is, giggle, giggle channel? No, right? The only people, I don't think any dude is going to watch that either other than to make fun or to look at it or whatever. But then when we're talking subs, there's a whole big giant world out there of 15 year old kids who are going to look at anything, mm -hmm. boobs and trigger. And, you know, this whole like literally anime is period like that exists mm -hmm. for boobs and triggers, right? So I think for some of that, you know, you're going to, that that's going to happen. But like I was saying, it's sort of like the deal where we talked about with the drugs or stuff. If they made heroin legal today, I don't know anybody who's going to go out and do heroin, right? If it was legal. It doesn't, that's not what's preventing people. So I think that uh, if you, by yourself and others doing alternatives to that jiggly, bubbly crap, then uh, more moms and grandmoms and shooters and wives and everybody else can find you. And then, you know, I don't know, I guess at the beginning of all this, you're not the first. There's been plenty of, uh, I guess, attempts to be like a, what do I want to say, like a professional or like a, an actual lady doing, you know, guns and stuff. Um, but because there's in the past they haven't the females just haven't been as large a segment of the uh, uh, what's the word industry I guess industry um, you know they're not buying enough of the guns holsters well that's changing like you say all the dang time so as that changes I would assume that the channels like yourselves that are creating valid content are just going to be found by more and more people jumping in and figuring out, oh there's something for me there because imagine even if some lady would have jumped in six years ago all she would have seen is bubbly jiggly stuff and you know very she would have seek out like uh babes with bullets or something to find older ladies doing their thing you know actually shooting competitively and having fun and you know, that kind of stuff um and like i say if you air into the competition and there's all kinds of ladies competing i think there's probably more ladies competing than dudes i think definitely more younger ladies than young dudes the only other downside that that really gets me right now is oh scheduling working working a full-time job and trying to go to all the events is frustrating it's things i want to do i want to go it's just hard to fit it all in yeah with as much stuff as there is like having to ration i guess mm -hmm. <laughs> Eat small bites yeah oh yeah you have to schedule out your your vacation time and your holiday time and you have to save it up because if you think about it because i work 12-hour shifts you know one weekend in tulsa that eats up 36 hours well you know that that takes me what four months of vacation to save up for a three-day weekend well you don't really need christmas do you is going to push them together. Well, I end up saving my holiday time for Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's to be able to do SHOT Show. So I still have to be careful with all that. Another bad thing about, about the 2A that I don't like is that my range is closed early. You know, if, if you happen to be a night guy, you know, there's, I guess there is one in town that's 24 hour, but that's an indoor range. Uh, parking garages, suppressors equal <laughs> a lot of opportunity that should be ranges all night, right? If they're not full of cars, then they should be ranges. They got a lights, so they got backstops, so they got mm -hmm. giant planks of space. They got, you know, places to put the targets at night when they're, or during the day when they're parking garages golf courses those driving ranges come on there's this yeah. giant driving range they just made here it's like three stories tall or something you can see it off the highway it's lit up all night i don't think it's open all night it should be open all night for shooting just give if you can't like they should just have a big pile of suppressors at the door and you just bring uh either a threaded gun or some sort of a jam some kind of adapter on there and then you're just shooting quiet all night leave it and you leave 
like on your honor, drop it in the bin to get washed when you leave. I like that idea. All right. Well, we had a lot of talk about how fun the two A is, and then we talked a little bit about how what is what's bad about two A, and uh, we had some interesting ideas, but they're all wrong. So anybody that wants to try to guess what the actual bad thing about the only bad thing about two A, and uh, type it into the chats out there. We'll see if anybody wins that contest. And then uh, anything else we want to talk about tonight? Oh, Pam says, you know, it's not fun waiting for the ATF to occur in your form four. Yeah. Well, that there is an ATF. Are you waiting for them in the chat to try to guess it? They'll never guess it. They're all sleeping. They did give us a massive, <laughs> much better thumb ratio, so I appreciate that. I figure it's the fact that we constantly have to defend it. I don't think that's a negative. I think that uh, that's a good one. I mean, I can understand what you're saying, but I think that we're better off, we're stronger when we realize that the cost of liberty is eternal vigilance. And I think we get, uh, I don't want to say we get coddled because of our safety and our security. And uh, how Reagan said, we're one generation away. If we, it doesn't go through our blood, it doesn't, you know, we don't pick up something out of our belongings of our grandparents that gives us an appreciation for what we have so i think that's over the end huh uh, the, go ahead but anyway so i think that uh we do want to have because we're always going to have somebody somebody who doesn't like this country is always going to be against us right so isn't the internal struggle better than an external real war right like wouldn't we rather have adversaries like we've got now that are anti-gun adversaries versus a real Russia, or a real China, or a real Mexican cartels coming across the border, Canadian cartels. Nobody talks about the snow cartels. All right. Well, so anything else we want to chat about tonight? Uh, let's see what's going on, on the calendar. here. I think today was one of the, well, I know today was one of the uh, Militia Acts. So we had the Militia Act of 1862 was July 17th. So the prior Militia Act had said everybody who's of age, of, of, of age and white is in the militia. And then in 1862, they changed it to everyone who's of age, period. Uh, which basically allowed for uh, uh, black soldiers in the Civil War and, and on from there. Um, also, uh, today on the 7th, well, depending where you are, on the 17th, uh, Browning did his first contract with FN. So uh, he had been working with Winchester and stuff here, and I guess they didn't want his pistols. So he took them to FN. Is that the story? I'm not saying I'm an expert on Browning. But I know that today was uh, the first contract in 1897 between uh, Belgium, FN, and Browning to make a blowback 32 ACP. And then it says production started in 1899. So it took them a couple of years to get up and rolling. Uh, we don't have nothing going on the 18th. However, on the 19th, we got some interesting stuff going on, a couple of interesting birthdays. Samuel Colt is born this Friday, and Glock, Edston Glock, born on Friday also. So is that a coincidence or what? That both Colt and Glock have the same birthday, a couple years off from each other, 1929 and... Obviously proof of reincarnation. Yeah, plenty of time. Could have been a whole nother life in between there too. So that's the kind of stuff we try to talk about over on the gun uh, calendars.com. So if you're uh, chatting at a gun shop or at a gun show or something, uh, Armament's throwing another two bucks in there. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's going to go into a big pile because this channel is never going to get $100. <laughs> 
uh, it barely has monetization. So I appreciate it. But uh, if you want to throw it over to the 2A History Project, then it goes on to a clicker in front of a bunch of people. So it adds to a pile, but appreciate it. Um, nobody has, oh, looks like uh, Angelina might have figured it out. Even though she has two links, she decided not to jump in here. And uh, 9 millimeter. Oh, no, Dead Horse had it in here. Yeah, nine millimeter. The obsession. See, nine millimeter. Not only being a Nazi round, did it create? Okay, yeah. A bunch of Germans created it, and then they created Nazis because of it. So yes, it wasn't created by Nazis, but it created Nazis. And then this millimeter obsession that people have in this country. Look at what it caused. Look what happens when they have this nine millimeter obsession. They start drilling holes in their guns. They start whittling on them. They start painting them all kinds of colors. They go crazy. So this whole nine millimeter fad has just been the worst thing about two way. I thought it was the NFA. No, the NFA is sitting there minding its own business. Some infringements are just fine, like night strikes. Oh. Some of them oh, are necessary. That's great. <laughs> Nine millimeters is a self, 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 whatever. All right. So, um, if anybody else has anything else, we can uh, end it with that. Um, DTP says an internal enemy is harder to fight. But maybe that's a topic for another day. Is it better to fight with the people we've got today, the Bloombergs and the Pelosi's and the Feinsteins and the, I don't know who's going to be next, or real China, real Russia, real Mexico, real Venezuela? No. I don't know. Does anybody in South America have an army? I don't think so. Nobody in Africa has an army, right? But maybe India? Like if they got pissed at us for some reason? They have an army. I don't know. I think Vandalistic Vlogs had a really good one out there. Or what well, was the worst thing ever about 9mm? Well, it's not universally acknowledged. What do you mean? But the worst thing about the 2A, I mean. Oh. It's, not, it's not universally acknowledged. That's, I don't know, that's a pretty good one. That, I, I gotta give it to him. That's, I think that's better than mine. But that's why it's so valuable because we do have it and other countries have abandoned that concept and uh we like to think we're right correct so uh one of the few things we have that makes us unique and lets us live without fear of our neighbors so i guess with that we'll end it anybody else seems like i'm and teeth so we're gonna we're done uh thanks everybody for showing up thanks again for the uh well we had an incredibly high thumb ratio but then a whole bunch of new people joined who didn't thumb so i don't know what's going on with that but appreciate it and uh we'll be back tomorrow on thursday talking about tech and industry then on friday i really need money so we're going to be doing all kinds of crazy free patch friday plus like free free, free patch other stuff or something on friday Free other stuff on Friday uh, to try to raise some funds uh, going into a giant set of bills coming up next year or next month. And uh, again, we want to uh, encourage everyone, uh, ask everyone to uh, help share the uh, project over on the Indiegogo, uh, trying to um, get a whole bunch of $2 to pile up so that we can inspire some of the people that are going to gun rights policy, facilitate some of those efforts do the uh, interviews and cartoons to uh, create something that we can bring to the uh, gun rights policy, but uh, also the uh, project itself so that we can show them behind the scenes uh, how fundraising happens and ideally how about a whole bunch of little $2 can add up. Uh, $2 meaning ideally somebody could take $20 and give it to 10 different projects out there and uh, affect some real change with our wallets, which as capitalists is something that we should exercise. Perhaps. Anybody going to plug anything? Let's see. Tomorrow is Thursday already. I got to put the garbage out. Um, Dead Horse, you got anything going on tomorrow? I'll just have another uh, evening lobby tomorrow. And uh, the early watch will be back next week. Okay. So then I might do something in the midday. Uh, working again on that 2A history project, uh, doing some cartoons and trying to get some awareness out. That's only an 18 day project. And uh, let's see, Armenthia, you've got a show Sunday. Anything coming up before then? 
Um, hopefully, I'll get out to the range tomorrow. Other than that, you've got Clover's Nerd Chat tomorrow night. Oh, well, we'd let him promote that if he was in here, but he's too busy sleeping or something. Uh, <laughs> he had a... Uh, he was one, grilling earlier. He had uh, one of the um, Wednesday shows go live today, I'm sure, too. He did. Uh, two shotgun kids, I believe. Oh, yeah, that's right. The black powder shotgun competition. That seems crazy. I didn't even know that was a thing. Um, do you know what his topic is tomorrow? I don't know that he knows what his topic is for tomorrow. It'll probably, it'll probably be what's so fun about 2A because he always copies off of me. <laughs> that's possible. Uh, I'll make Wood, sure I put that out there to him. Woods is uh, stripping a wood floor. So sticking with uh, nomenclature. Yep. Still got half the house to do. Right on. Uh, Patriot, thanks for jumping in. And you got anything going on? Yeah, I heard you got some shirts. shirts I have, like to wear shirts. Yeah, I, I still have to get them adjusted a little bit. But my, my daughter's home after being gone for two weeks. So we're, we're going to be playing. And I have a woodworking project I've been trying to film. and So that'll be coming out. See if I can make a rifle crate make it another locker or something bigger uh this it's a 20 inch wide uh it's kind of the cavalry style boxes that i've made before but like a football? Some, yeah but smaller it's, okay. it's like yeah like pistols or ammo or something but it's the same kind of style got some some birch i'm working with so we'll see how that turns out <laughs> Uh, and then Dead Or City's got the thing, so that's everybody. Uh, let's see. Uh, like I say, I'll probably do something during the day tomorrow if I can sneak it in. And we'll be back uh, tomorrow to talk about whatever, after way after Clover. So it'll be late tomorrow. Guys and gals of GunWebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thanks for watching GunWebsites.com.